What would happen if you said, more God, I want more? On today's program, we're gonna talk about people in history that not only said they want more, they got more. Make sure you don't go away. We'll be right back with today's program. In every generation, there have been revivals, massive moves of the spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call, to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. We're about to take you face to face with history. Welcome to Revival Radio TV. I'm your host, Gene Bailey. Glad you're with me. Well, I'm here at the cork board with my good friend, Pastor Greg Stevens. Greg, on these next few shows, we're going to talk about waves of revival. Now, this is not all the waves of revival, but we're going to talk about it in the 20th century. We're going to take you on a journey. We're going to take you down a journey, a path of one revival, one revival to the next revival and the waves that happen. Okay, so Greg, the first one, baptism in the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. This is uh, Azusa, Parham, Topeka, Kansas, all of those together. Right. Tomlinson, Church of God, everything. Carries over into the healing revivals. That's wave two. Yes. The healing ladder ring. Now, a lot of you may have thought, well, this is, this, Brother Hagin's in the wrong spot. He's not because of what happened. Remember, he was healed as a young boy, mm -hmm. and the healing that he went that launched into the great tent revivals. You can recognize a lot of these people. Teal Osborne. Which takes us Catherine to the wow, wave three charismatic renewal. Exactly. And so here we have this guy who affected Demis everything. Demas Sherkarian all the way over. Pat Robertson. Now we've got television taking this right. same spirit worldwide. Brother Copeland, the yep. Crouches. Which is way for the word of faith teaching and the teaching of faith and Bible. And here's the interesting thing, Gene, and you can follow it with the strings. From where we're at today, the line is unbroken in That's each right. and every wave. Each one of these waves connects to the other one. And which takes us to the fifth wave right down here, the final wave, the wave of the Holy Ghost. So let's get right in to wave number one. Thanks, guys, for coming back. It's been a while. It has been long. Pastor Greg Stevens and, of course, Linda Lane, and my good friend from across the water, Tulsa. Tulsa. Uh, Doug <laughs> Thanks, Doug, for being Thank here. You. Guys, I'm, I'm excited about today because we're going to talk about waves of revival. And when you start talking about waves of revival, it's really easy to think about. You try to go back in your mind, uh, where's the first wave that I remember? We're not going that far back <laughs> because we can't. We're going to talk about 20th century far back on waves of revival. But the first one is about the Pentecostals. You know, Gene, I would call that a tsunami. Tsunami. I mean, if you were there, a small church, an old stable was converted into a, a church in mm -hmm in what's uh, real close to Chinatown in central Los Angeles, and it's called Azusa Street. Azusa, well, right. all they had had was the holiness movement, the sanctification, and so what happened with this wave was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's what... But it goes, it goes back further, um, uh, and the reason I pointed at you first, but let's talk about Smith Wigglesworth back in 1900. What, tell me about miracles that happened with him, even about a leg. Tell me about that one. Yeah, well, here's a plumber, and well, really, he's a businessman. He can't really preach too much because his wife was the uh, uh, preacher, so he focused one-on-one, -on -one, and he would, he would get people healed. He'd been baptized in the Holy Spirit a year after Azusa. So Azusa had already crossed the Atlantic in one year um, in October. Of, of 1907, and he would pray for people. I think you know that story, I think, better than I, don't you, hear, Linda, of, the, of a leg growing. He would go and he would pray for a person one hour a day. Lord, who do you want to have healed today? Who do you want to have saved? Well, this one gentleman didn't have a leg at all. So he told him, he says, you will have this miracle happen. And, and the guy says, what, you know? So he goes to, this, to the store, you know, and he tells the sales guy, I, I need shoes. I'm going to have legs. And the guy says, well, you don't have them now. So he puts the shoes down on the floor and he moves into position. And right there, as a miracle in front of everyone at that store, the leg grew and filled up the shoe. And it was 
How cool is that, right? That's very cool. That'll start something. That'll, yeah, that'll, that'll sell start some shoes. That'll start <laughs> something. But, Craig, it goes back or even earlier than that to Parham. Yeah. And, and, well, you did a, well, before we even talk did about a whole that, program on that, tell, didn't you, tell Kansas? Me that what she just, what Linda just talked about, that's a revival. How is that a revival? Because when we think revivals, we're thinking tent meetings and all that. Well, but yet was, that was a revival. It was a, it was a miracle. Uh, he was actually more of a one-on-one -on -one and then later went into congregations and churches. But well, What's the definition of revival? I heard it said this way one time. Revival starts when you hear something or experience something new from God. It's redigging that well Yeah, is what it is. And then it ends when you're challenged and you don't like it. So you shut it down. When you feel the well life. back up. Right. Yeah, when you right. feel, you cover your own well back up. Yeah. So Wow. That's what good. I've seen is a, a revival. It restores a truth that has been lost to the church. So we have the original day of Pentecost. Everyone's baptized in the Holy Spirit. They all speak in other tongues. But by the second century, it's, it's kind of waning, but it's still available to everyone. We went through the dark ages. I mean, there's thousands of years yeah. of history here. Yeah. Yeah, where there's really tangibly no move of the spirit, you would say, and it's in so the earth. But um, in the 1880s here, Greg, we have people who are praying for something they don't know what they're praying for, and it's the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And it's so funny. There's a, a great story here. Is is um, Azusa Street was just an explosion of the baptism and that wave of the Holy Spirit, but it crossed the Atlantic to England, and there's. A, a plumber called Smith Wigglesworth, he gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he says to his wife, I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she said, I've got as much of the Holy Spirit as you have. And so she said, well, okay, we'll see then. Because she was the preacher. He would try and get up and, and share his testimony, but he was tongue-tied and he would end up just crying and getting frustrated. So he, was, he went out onto the highways and the byways. So, so here comes Sunday at the mission in Bradford, England, and she says, okay. So she sat on the front pew that seats nine people on her own, and she's like this. We'll see what Wigglesworth has got. Okay, I've because, taught in those kind of places, have you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there we go. So anyway, the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon him. He gets up, and he starts to preach from Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And she is so, so... Um, I don't know, frustrated because she sees he's been really changed. And in the end, she said, that's not my Wigglesworth. But she saw that something had happened. Yeah, something had changed. And that's the other part of a revival. There's a change. A big change. A refreshing and there's a change. But let's go back even a few years before Azusa because that's, that's... Parham, Topeka, Kansas. That's right. Parham, that's exactly where yeah. I'm going. You know, I think what's, what's so exciting to me about Mr. Parham he knew there was more. He wasn't satisfied and he knew there was more. So what do you do when you, you don't know what to do? Is you, well, you start a Bible school because <laughs> there's <laughs> evidently there's more there than, than what he knows. Amen. And so all of these students come and they're there to learn and get more. And they didn't just come into Stone's Folly at that building and just go to school there. They lived there. They cows, lived in the, the cows are tied up outside. Oh my word! You know they're they're living, but they're all there for the same purpose. There's unity mm -hmm. in wanting more mm -hmm. of God, and they're trying to figure out what is it that they're miss, missing. And thank God for Agnes Osmond. Amen. Who's who decides? She sees it in Scripture. Hey, look, look here it is. It says, "If you'll lay hands on me, I'll receive," you know, the next thing. I'm standing here in Topeka, Kansas, right at the corner of 17th and Stone Avenue. This is the site where Stone's Folly was originally built. It's an amazing story. Now, why do we come to places like this to commemorate it? Because this is the site, this ground I'm standing on is the place where the baptism in the Holy Spirit was poured out on Charles Parham and his school right here at Stone's Folly. From here, went to Houston. That's where he met, as you all know, William Seymour, which led to the Azusa Revival. Well, just attend the guys, I guess, get on my soapbox here about contending for more is what we all need to be doing. We have never arrived to the place that we don't want more. Yes. But also think about it. Parham was preaching the baptism of the Holy Spirit after Agnes got it, and he didn't have it. I mean, 
Seymour went to California and That's he right. didn't have it. <clears throat> He's watching everyone around him get filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and he doesn't have it yet. I mean, that's like John Wesley preaching about salvation before he was saved. Right. Well, you, there's faith for what you teach. And so what, if you begin to teach on something, there's faith for that. Well, yeah, because they see that it's in the Bible. It has to right. be in the Bible. Otherwise, it doesn't belong to <laughs> yeah. us. Yeah, and that's why he had faith for it, because he believed it. Yes. In the Word, before it had manifested in himself. Yeah. He believed and he's watching it happen. That's right. In other people. That's good. Wow. So Something now? that was so big that I see with the Azusa Street was that, yeah, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. but just as Wigglesworth's wife said, well, I've got as much of the Holy Spirit as you have, is they, is they realized that they didn't have something that the Bible had promised, and that was speaking in other tongues. This is a shoe. This is my shoe here. And Did you just take that I, off? I just took this <laughs> off. Did you? Oh, gosh. But you know what? It comes with the tongue. But in the 1880s, we had a whole lot of people who said, I have the baptism in the Holy Spirit, but they didn't have the, the, um, the gift of speaking the evidence, in right. of our tongues. And that's where Azusa Street makes all the difference. Um, and Parham said to his students, what is the main or one big Bible evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit? And do you know what happened when they came back to him? They said, speaking in other tongues. So the tongues comes with the shoes, guys. <laughs> if you're yeah. baptized in the Holy Spirit, you will speak in tongues. <laughs> well, good. Azusa was huge because everyone that came through Azusa just got, you know, had that fire, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, healing. I mean, John G. Lake was there for weeks and he came by and actually Parham sent him over. Hey, let's, let's you know, go fill up. I know you're going to go out of the country. And, and he, so he did, but what a difference because at Azusa they had fire coming off the top of the buildings, which we're going to see again. They had fog and manifestations on the ground. Yeah. The children would run to the door to see who could be the one that had the opportunity to pray for someone. But here is the badge of the Holy Spirit that is hitting people's lives. They're speaking in tongues. It's transforming. It just changes everything. And you know, notice here, Pastor Greg, we, we see... In every great wave, you're going to see a great push and also great resistance. Okay, so here's what I got one day when I was setting out, you know, where I was at. I was in La Jolla in California. Yeah. And I was sitting on the ocean and just meditating. And I noticed waves coming in. It was a real high surf day and waves were coming in. And the greatest resistance to a new wave yes. was the previous wave going out. That's so true. Right. And well, what if we have wildfire? Well, you probably will, but that's okay. Because that'll all straighten out. Because there was many denominations that came out of Azusa. Many. And different, different church groups came out of that. It exploded around the world. Yeah. Around the world. Just like it did on the first outpouring in, in Acts chapter 2. Yes, yeah, because the world it was there. Went, it went worldwide. Yeah, yeah. And that's the big difference. Because we have, you know, outpourings. But as um, we emphasize it so much because so much came out of it. These guys, they didn't come and stay and think, good, I'm going to you know, have a nice church home here. It was almost like, go, go be the one. And, and we want you to come and be recharged and refilled. But we don't want you to stay here. Because like in the Old Testament, you know, the fire by day, Mm. No, the fire by night, the cloud by day. When it moved, the children of Israel had to go with it. You know what I was just thinking of? Because that is leading up to the first Pentecost. And when Pentecost was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, Jesus had given them instructions to go to Jerusalem and tarry there till you're endued with power. And then you'll be witnesses around the world for them. Historically, this is right before World War I and going into World War II, a really dark time in yeah. world history. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's, I don't think we can stress it enough that the Holy Spirit being poured out worldwide prior to those two moments in our history, preparing us, yeah. preparing the nations. Because it took 10 years after, after Pentecost, when they were there, the, the disciples didn't leave. They stayed in Jerusalem. It took them 10 years to go preach to Cornelius. Yeah. And then the Gentiles were filled. Wait. I've seen this that in so that's a wave resisting. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean in West Africa, where a ministry that I worked for for a number of years was heavily based, we had a tremendous outpouring and then a civil war. Yeah. And it's like my word, all the devil you know can do is let's try and shake the whole nation to stop this. 
but it's also preparation for what is coming. You know, I mean, you know, there are things we can stop, there are things we have to go through, there are things we go around. It's leading up to the next wave. Well, we have I'm like sorry. Amy Semple McPherson, who came out of the Salvation Army, and they were all about relief. They, in fact, when all the things happened that were so horrible with any sort of disaster, they were first on the on the spot. And here's Amy growing up through all this, learning how to preach about, you know, preach Jesus. You know, she had a gospel car. You know, how to help people. She had a sevenfold ministry, uh, community relief during the 1930s when, when you had everyone that was starving, you know, they were out there helping. And she was on radio, you know, getting out in every voice that was available. And what I like what you're talking about right there, you see women as well. Oh, Maria yeah, Woodworth Edder. Absolutely. Is another one. Went on trial. 1915, and, yeah. yes. And interracial. From day one, the pastor of Azusa Street, the tsunami that changed the whole world, mm -hmm. was African American. Yeah, it was unheard of. Unheard of. His father was a slave. I mean, yeah. he, yeah. Ra but that hunger for God, it always okay. came back to that. All right, let's talk about the second, the second wave that came on the heels of this. And I want to start this off by reading a prophecy that Brother Hagen back in 1943. So let me read this to you. I would awake and find myself unconsciously praying, may these greater, more mighty manifestations of your spirit come into operation. Then on the 23rd day of February, 1943, after praying that day for five hours and 45 minutes, God began to say to something to me. <clears throat> I got my pencil and I wrote it down. He said, at the close of World War II, there will come a revival of divine healing to America. That was more than two years before the war was over. Thank God for the Spirit of God. Thank God for prayer. That revival of divine healing came. It started in 1947. But it didn't come because somebody had prayed the week before in 1947. It came because people, not just me, but others, were praying back in 1943. I want also to set the context of that. Mm -hmm. And it was in the 1940s, all these great elder statesmen were dying. Yes. Yeah. From the previous. From, from yeah. the previous way. So my question is, is it all over? Mm. No. Yeah. So here's the thing. If the, you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you don't have that prophecy. You don't have that yeah. word of knowledge coming forth. Because it was tongues. He was praying in yeah. tongues. Yeah, right which you don't have that if you don't have Azusa prior to it. So each one builds upon yeah. the other. Okay, Greg, so we've just covered wave one, baptism in the Holy Spirit, which there's no way we've got enough time. And now we're going to wave two. As these guys passed away, we have wave two, the healing and the latter rain. Right after World War II, the world and the nation needs a healing. And God sent it through these people. That's right. World War II, we have wave two, and it's focused on healing. And so we have all of these awesome evangelists that are having spe ex spectacular healing experiences. Uh, we've got William Branham who could see over the wall and see into a person's That's life. That's right. You got something there on William Branham, right? Oh, you're here, Voice of Healing. Yeah. Okay, so we have this huge healing revival and this magazine is what glued it all together because these guys were small guys from the wrong side of the tracks and a gentleman called Gordon, Gordon Lindsay. That's right. And he was a writer and he got these guys together and they would all advertise in the voice of healing. This is the first edition of Yeah, it. and actually Doug, you know, a um, little history here on William Branham. Uh, Gordon Lindsay was actually his road manager. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, he started off Taking, taking care of setting up these meetings. And then um, real quickly, William Brennan decided he was done and he wanted to get out of it. Yep. He, uh, Gordon Lindsay had, had all these bookings and he had to fill them up. So he filled it up with, oh, people like Oral Roberts and uh, Jack Coe and others that he would, and that's how, A. Allen, that's how the voice of healing great story. became what it was because it was all different ministers filling up these things. And then eventually William Brennan came back yep. and they let him, welcomed him back into the fold and he became one of, of the ministers there. But William Branham and, and boy, and of course. What a team though. What a team. Uh, Catherine Kuhlman mm -hmm. born in this, in, during this era. A.A. A. Allen, which we, we still never feel like we have covered the scope of what happened in that mm -hmm. man's ministry. I mean, it is amazing to see this, the movement of healing. When you watch these old videos, you see 
the power of God operating, Greg, in a way that we don't see all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what you see in that, as you, as you see that video there, you're seeing a bold step of faith that even today, all these years later, we don't see that. Remember, there's the one, the clip where he's talking about this guy that can't eat and he's got a digestion. He goes, well, go get a man a sandwich. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Now that's faith. Oh, oh, yeah. well, in front of 2,000 people sure. in a tent, go get the man a sandwich. We're gonna sure. have, he's going to get healed. And Jack Ho, who ripped tumors off of the necks, it's just like, and, and they're healed. They were completely healed. That's bold. That's what you call all in. <laughs> You're all in. Oh, yeah. You're all in. It's like all in on going to jail. It's dedication. In fact, one time, I've seen an old video, a woman had a few spine. He puts his knee right in the back and he bends her over and says, oh, you're getting here to I'm going to jail. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Catherine Kuhlman, she's a teenager, 15 years old, and she goes and she preaches at her first church. Well, the thing is, is the only place they could put her up at was in a chicken house. So she's staying overnight. I mean, she's never despise small beginnings. And she just kept going. And, but she didn't have any miracles until she said, you know, put God first. And in that statement, he's more real to me than you are. At least she had breakfast already prepared. <laughs> hey. <laughs> there we go. So, yeah, but it's amazing healing. And, and I like this is the latter rain. And you know, Greg, without getting too far off topic here, you know, it's in the scripture. Every time, not every time, most of the time you see water, mm. whether it's the outpouring, the latter rain, it's about a move of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Streams yes. in the desert. Oh, absolutely. There's going Out to of be your belly shall flow, flow rivers. rivers yeah. Of what, yeah. This is the Holy Spirit moving. And then what we saw in this wave of revival was such massive healings and things that were happening that had never been seen before. And what was it that Brother Hagin used to always say? You know, you used to quote that, you know, signs are there to make you wonder. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and so that's what a, the dinner bell for salvation. When you see somebody's leg grow or their foot grow into a shoe or, you know, they eat a sandwich when they've got, you know, stomach cancer. I mean, all of these things that will make you sit up and look and take note. And I love that about God, that he's so practical. <laughs> he's not religious. He's practical. Mm -hmm. And what Jesus did for us is so practical. All right, what have you got? I heard Brother Hagen say in those years, and it was the 1950s and- The easiest thing in the world. It was yes. the easiest thing. Okay, so years later in, in the UK, I'm hearing a, a, a minister say in the 1950s in England, he said those same words. He said it was so- Because it's it a so wave. Easy. It was a wave. Doug, it's a, there's an anointing for that right now. And people just jumped on that wave, didn't they? Yeah, surfs up. But, but that wave <laughs> surfs up. Surfs up. But really, it's always been up, hasn't it? Yeah. But we're just discovering and it's being reintroduced to the church. Well, and I think there is, and you're right, it's always there. God never changes. No. Mm -mm. It's, so it's us that gets out of the flow when we is. start walking there on we the go. bank when we should be relaxing in the river. <laughs> oh, you yeah. know, and that's, that's where we miss it. So and, I have so, a connection to this, okay. this time with my grandfather. Yes, you do. Tell that story. Because... He was a pastor of the first Pentecostal Holiness Church in Enid, Oklahoma. Hmm. And a young evangelist wanted to help hold a tent meeting. And, my grandfather, and he hadn't had a tent meeting before. No. And, and my grandfather said, okay, and I'll, I'll partner with you. Because he was trying to get other churches. And so first Pentecostal Holiness partnered with a guy named Oral Roberts. Oh, my word. His first tent meeting. How fun. In Enid, Oklahoma. How about that? But I, heard, I remember growing up as a kid, hearing my grandfather talk about stories about things that happened in these meetings hmm. that were just amazing. He, he was preaching one time and he said, um, lightning, he heard a crack of thunder or whatever, and a literal fireball fell in the building. Poof, and sparks went everywhere. And he said, uh, every person in the room was slain in the spirit instantly. Wow. He said he was standing there by himself. And, wow. and uh, when, they all got, when they got up, they all got up speaking in tongues, including, including the sinners. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, he said, and there was a, it, that meeting went for weeks. That's That's rock and week right and there. week and week after week after week. Yeah. But this is a guy that got saved throwing rocks at a brush arbor back in the early 1900s. Yeah. And so all of the different things. He said he watched one person dance in the spirit, eyes closed, head up. 
and danced right off the stage in midair and danced right back on the stage. It didn't wow. fall. That'll mess with you. Wow. That'll mess with you. And so I heard all these things yeah. as a kid growing up, huh. you know, and, and it was part of that, part of that wave. My grandfather decided he was going to be the one and I'm not going to mm. come against this. I want to, I want to hook up with this. Yeah. And saw so many things. Well, and, they, and what's interesting, you telling that story, how many years mm -hmm. has it been? Oh, well, I and wasn't what, around. Yeah. So you, are, you aren't that old, are you? I'm not that old. <laughs> oh, <okay. So. laughs> So talking about Oral Roberts, I mean, come on, we've got Kenneth Hagen, who is awesome. Oral Roberts, you know, healed of tuberculosis as a youth. You know, he goes and, and has this amazing healing experience. We have so much power that showed up in their lives. I'll tell you how they did it. Tell me. I, I, my grandfather, I'm speaking to him now, and Brother Hagen's the same way. I got to be around him. I never heard a harsh word come out of his mouth. Oh, my word. Ever. Oh my mm. word. All my life growing up, never heard him swear, never heard a harsh word, never heard him speak bad about anyone, but I watched him pray. And this was one of his favorite passages, and this is how it works. This is how it worked in Acts chapter 2. It's how it worked mm -hmm. in Azusa. And how it, this, is the, this is the pattern of how this works. Psalm 133, Passion Translation. How truly wonderful and delightful to see brothers and sisters living together in sweet unity. It's as precious as a sacred synod oil flowing from the head of the high priest Aaron, dripping down upon his beard, running all the way down to the hem of his priestly robes. The heavenly harmony can be compared to the dew dripping down from the skies upon Mount Hermon, refreshing the mountain slopes of Israel. For from this realm of sweet harmony, God will release his eternal blessing, the promise of life forevermore. Hmm. It's unity. Yeah. And when you get a kind of, you saw it with Benny Hinn. Yeah, absolutely. When you can get a congregation, A.A. A. Allen, Roberts, they all came wanting to see something. They were in agreement. They mm -hmm. were in unity. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you something. If we can get our churches and our people in unity for a move of the Spirit, yeah. you can't stop it. The preacher can't stop it. Nobody could stop it. And you'll find the people that are in agreement, well, they'll swim right out. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's, you know, and, and we find that later in history, in even bank. to uh, Pensacola. They'll stay on the side. They, they, <laughs> a lot, they lost a lot of their congregation. Yeah. There's all, and I don't want to capitalize on the, the negative, but there is a resistance. Yeah. These guys, especially uh, Oral and A. Allen and Jack, they had such a huge, uh, a huge time that they had to overcome racism, bigotry, it was it was tough. Yeah, they they broke ground because people just didn't want to. You know, there were so many people that said we don't want healing to be a normal part of the discussion. Just like in the Baptist and Holy Spirit, you know, there was resistance there. There was resistance here. They're breaking new ground. This wave it broke it. In the life of Jesus, they resisted him. They didn't resist him healing people. Right. They resisted him saving people. Today, we don't resist people being saved, but we resist people being saved. Because I think it's because it makes uh, church people uncomfortable. Yeah. And it's out of control. Mm -hmm.